Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Um, before we even start, we have some thank yous to say um, to you, of course, for being here, uh, to the organizers for inviting us to speak, and to all the volunteers who have helped put on this uh, wonderful week of Python and um, friendship that is a, a EuroPython. Genuinely honored to be um, here in front of you. It means a great deal to us. And just being here is going to be an important contribution uh, to a movement, Python in Africa, that we're both deeply involved in. And, and we feel quite responsible here, speaking for a lot of people. Yeah, we? no yeah. pressure. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so thank you again. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Aisha Bello. I work as a virtual systems engineer in the global virtual engineering practice um, for Cisco Systems. Uh, among other things, I um, helped do support for Django Girls. I started the Django Girls movement in Nigeria, and I've helped mentor and coach at other events. I also help organize Pi Ladies um, in Nigeria. And this picture actually is one that is that I've grown to love because it was in 2015 and my first Euro Python conference and my first ever um, interaction with the Python community and even Python as a tool. So yes, do you think I look any different now than I was then, two years ago? I can't see from the same, but you look just fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm uh, Daniele Procida. I work for Didio, uh, a Swiss Django company that provides hosting and development services for Python and Django um, developers. I'm a great lover of uh, Django and Python in its community and its uh, conferences. I'm a core member of the Django development team. Um, yesterday, um, there was uh, some remarks about people's level of Python power from um, uh, Tracy Osborne. And I, I'd just like to point out that th this, is, this is what I look like on television, by the way. I don't know if you can see, but it says that I am, in fact, Python software. So um, let's not have any arguments about that. Um, now, what Aisha and I have been talking about a lot, and what we're interested in, is what Python mean for each other and what emerges from the encounter between them. Um, and as always in an encounter, the most important kind of encounter is an encounter between uh, people. And here it's the encounter between people that Python in Africa represents. And encounters really matter because they are what change people when they happen. And in our Python world, we can trace these encounters through the events that we stage. So we're going to start with um, our PyCons, our national scale international events where you get to meet uh, new people. So we've got um, Python, PyCon South Africa, which is well established. South Africa is quite different from most other African uh, countries. Um, and then after PyCon South Africa, since 2015, we've had PyCons in um, Namibia, and then since 2016 in Zimbabwe, and then coming later this year, the first PyCon uh, Nigeria. And people are just like ideas. You have to spend time with them. You have to hang around with them and try and work with them in order to understand them. And that's why events where people meet are so um, valuable. And another way you can me measure activity is a Jungle Girls event, which is like, um, as you can see, we've had 62 workshops since Jungle Girls ever happened. The first one was in Uganda in 2015. And since then, we've had 62 workshops, and um, the highest of them being in Nigeria, which is 31 workshops. And I think what is more important for us to notice is that we, Jungle Girls events are happening in places that don't even have an established Python community in Africa, in places in Africa. And for example, in Africa, um, it's the World Bank had a report they published um, sometime in 2008 where it says 70% of SMEs are owned by women in Africa. So 70% of entrepreneurship in, in Africa are owned by 70% of women. Now, if you translate that to what that could mean for programming, it goes a long way to show the possibilities that Django Girls or even events like Pi Ladies uh, can have an impact, not just Africa as a whole, but the African woman. So, um, well, 
how did we get here? By the way, Aisha is very modest. I don't know if you saw that fully 50% of those Django Girls events have taken place in Nigeria. A and the reason is right here, so she's too modest to say that. Um, so how did it get started? Not Py uh, the PyCon South Africa, which was already established, but since then. Um, in 2014, I was working at Cardiff University School of Medicine, where I was the web team. And um, I had the notion of somehow helping to start a new PyCon somewhere in Africa. Because there'd been these PyCons in South Africa since 2012, but nowhere else. And I was trying to find an African Python community large enough to host a PyCon. And I went to see one of my colleagues who'd done a lot of work in Africa for some advice. And this was um, Professor Judith Hall, the uh, head of the anesthetics department. And she just looks like an ordinary professor, but in fact, she's actually a force of nature, isn't she? Yes, she is. Yeah. So she did have some advice. But much more interestingly, it turned out that she was starting a major long-term engagement project called the Phoenix Project between Cardiff University and the University of Namibia. Um, there's Namibia, in case you don't know where it is. It's a large place. It's larger than the landmass of Germany and Italy put together. But there are only two million people, just over two million people living there. So um, the professor had many questions for me, like, what is Python? What is open source software? What's a PyCon? Why? And we had some lengthy conversations. But to cut a long story short, the idea of a Namibian Python software conference was adopted as an official part of the Phoenix project. And suddenly, it wasn't just a notion anymore. We now had significant backing from two institutions. We had financial and logistical support. We had a lot of expertise. Uh, we had a venue, and we even had a guaranteed uh, audience. And then we had dates, and we had sponsors to whom we are eternally um, grateful. And we had speakers and people who were committing themselves to travel from different continents to Namibia in February 2015. And this was to run a new PyCon in a place that I'd never been before, with people I'd never met except via email and Skype, and for an audience whom we discovered didn't even know Python yet, because they, even the computer science students studied um, Java um, and C? C and other things. And they simply didn't know uh, Python at all. So my main thought was, this had better work. Because in my darkest moments, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I was convinced that the whole thing was a preposterous lunacy and that this couldn't possibly work. And I imagine people speaking about me in the future. You know, do you remember that idiot who tried to organize a PyCon in Namibia? Did you also wish that the plane uh, crashed? Uh, there was a volcano and you didn't have to go anywhere. We, I was praying for ash clouds or international bans on Python events and anything that would mean I didn't have to go ahead with what I'd said I would do. But um, despite all of this, um, we found ourselves um, on our way to Namibia and then walking into the venue for the first time where we found all these people waiting for us with some excitement. And then suddenly we were in the middle of a real live Python conference, doing all the things you expect from a PyCon, doing all these things um, together, um, people meeting each other for the first time and discovering things for the first time. And that PyCon was uh, a, a great success. But it wasn't actually that event that really mattered, but what happened afterwards. Because at that conference, the, Namib the Namibians formed their own Python Society, PyNAM, uh, the Python Programming Society of Namibia, and they got to work straight away. So the undergraduate students who'd been at the conference and had literally just learned Python, the next month, they'd managed to organize themselves with local high schools, and they were doing programming demonstrations and lessons for high school um, students. So um, there's Jessica. She's the chair of uh, PyNAM. And this is from the second year of uh, PyCon Namibia. And those are some of her high school students who came um, to the conference. So um, the Namibians took the idea and, and really ran with it. And earlier this year, we had PyCon Namibia 2017, the third edition of the conference. 
And just two years after that first event, um, PyCon is now taught at the university as a result of the PyCon. Uh, it's taught in high school, thanks to um, Jessica. Namibian businesses and developers have discovered Python. They say, wow, there's a software conference coming to Namibia. We, they don't get many of those. We better go and find out what that's about. So there's an active, growing community that's already organizing a PyCon now, PyCon Namibia, for next year. And one lesson from this is that you don't need a community to have a PyCon because you can create your community out from of the PyCon. Fr from the PyCon. <laughs> and another thing that um, the Namibian, the second Namibian conference last year did was to lead to a PyCon in Zim Zimbabwe. Because two of the people who came in 2016 were Anna Makarudze and Humphrey Boutau. They traveled well over 30 hours each way in a minibus. An absolutely horrendous journey. You know, after hearing about those travels, I've never once dreamt of complaining about my own long-distance journeys. And later that year, they, started, uh, they, had, they launched and held the first uh, Zimbabwean PyCon. And if you think that organizing a PyCon is an achievement, organizing one successfully in a country like Zimbabwe, which has many internal problems, is facing international sanctions, is really a triumph of perseverance and strength and ingenuity. And if they can do that, they can uh, do anything. So their first conference was a success, and the next one is taking place next month. And really importantly, it's sponsored by some companies that you, we already know and love. I mean, three of these sponsors are sponsors of this event. So I'm really grateful to these companies. I hope there's somebody from um, JetBrains or, or Nexmo here in the uh, audience to see this because this really matters, and we're so grateful for your support. To see not just that the Python communities are growing and developing in Africa, but that the rest of the global community is stepping forward to be part of them is literally a dream coming true. Um, Zimbabwe, unlike um, Namibia, already had an established Python community. It's a much bigger country. Very briefly, there's uh, Marlene Mangami. She's the first African board member of the Python Software Foundation. Um, there's... She's a woman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's um, um, Ronald, who's um, and some of his uh, fellow leaders of ZimboPy, which is an organisation dedicated to getting girls into coding. And finally, last year in Namibia, there was another important person who also went back home full of plans, and she went back home to Nigeria, and here she is to tell them about yes. them. <laughs> and. Um... That's the southern side of Africa. Now let's go to the western part of Africa. To start with, we're going to be having our first ever conference, PyCon Nigeria, September 15 and 16. And just take this as a personal invitation to come over to Nigeria or come over to your first African um, PyCon conference. And which um, I'm, I, I want to take a moment to appreciate the team I'm working with. They've been so dedicated. And I have more on the next slide. It's our first conference, so trust me, we need all hands on deck. That's why we have so many organizers at this point. And thankfully, I would also like to say thank you to our sponsors so far that are sponsoring us, which like the PSF, GitHub, and Endela, which is like a, a, local Python, a local software company in Nigeria. Now, moving on to Python Nigeria. Python Nigeria um, organically grew from a Jungle Girls event. Um, now we have... Um, over 700 Slack members because we have like a, a, a Slack Python community. And we have over 1,000 PyLady subscribers. I have a good explanation for that, why that is. And we have just in a second. And over 500 um, PyLady enthusiasts. So one of the things that we have in Nigeria, in Lagos, is that knowledge, the knowledge, knowledge is sought after. People want to learn a lot. And the thing is, Hi ladies is an opportunity or is the only event that has consistent um, Python tutoring. And the thing is, not just girls actually come. Sometimes we even get more guys coming than girls to a Pi Ladies event. And at the point, you know what, we were like, you know what, guys, if you want to come, make sure you come with a girl. Or don't come at all. We, you can't come and underrepresent us in our own event. No, it just doesn't work. So, yeah, it was, it was a bit of struggle there. And... Just to talk about numbers and how, how 
how much of an impact this has been. Django, we've had over 919 girls attend Django Girls events in 28 cities and in with 31 workshops, and there's still more upcoming. And what's also important to note is that girls from Nigeria went on to Ghana and organized one workshop in Accra, and that enabled the Ghanaian women go on and are currently just from two months back, uh, going on to organize their own um, workshops in places like Kumasi, Ho, Koforidwa, um, which is very, very, um, which is how the, the movement, or the Python movement, is spreading to other parts of West Africa, especially where there is no Python community or no Python presence. Django Girls is sometimes not regarded very fairly. So, um, some people think that Django Girls is all about um, cupcakes and heart-shaped balloons and a kind of girly party, so... It means a lot to us. Um, in our part of the world, it's, it's not news that Nigeria, um, two years ago, had made world news uh, where a sect called Boko Haram kidnapped over 200 girls in the middle of the night um, from their dormitory, and I've held most of them for over two years now. And there was this huge campaign, and we even had Michelle Burma say, bring back our girls, bring them now, we want them alive. What, what I wanted to mention here is how Jungle Girls have um, gone on to, do, to help these girls that are internally displaced from the north and trying to absorb them into the community based in Lagos. And um, a team called Abu Kodas, um, which, which they're very passionate about, you know, tech education in the north. And she's like, you know what, Aisha, we need one specifically for internally displaced girls. And this, is, this was quite different because even the organizer, Simi, she had to organize a workshop for the coaches because she, they had to be that, um, there had to be that conversation with them to say, you know what, these girls are not like your regular, you know, maybe girls that you already coach. These are very special, and there is a way you need to approach how you teach them or how, you know, they ask questions and how you should answer. And sometimes we even had um, translators actually trans try to talk to them in house languages, but most of the, the language that they use for the most part. So Django Girls is literally going into places where other people wouldn't even have the first idea how to begin exactly. working there. So I, I, think that's, I think that's really important to, to recognize the, um, the significance of, of, of this. And um, who's the, uh, who are the people in, in this photo? So Hamdala is actually uh, a treasurer from the Python Nigeria uh, community. And the girl, she was one of the girls from Bono State where um, Django girls have been no, actually, where Boko Haram has been like a terror and a turn in so many people's flesh. So moving on to how much more we've done the Python Nigeria community, we've actually partners, partnered with also other um, organizations. And this time we went to Ajegunle. Ajegunle is one of the major slums in Lagos. And we went to a, pub, a public school and, and picked 60 girls over a period of 12 weeks, and we taught we taught them how to code. Now, this is, this is quite unusual because many of these girls haven't ever had to see, they haven't seen the computer before. Um, they probably learn about it in class, but as an abstract concept or as something, as a computer that you put in the shelf and is admired from a distance, and most people are scared to go touch it. And so, with the help of Python Software Foundation, we're able to um, give these girls um, raspberry Pis at the end of the program, not just the Pis, the screens, keyboard, mouse, because most of them are coming from homes that they probably could not afford computers. And what is important here I would like to note is that um, that in the picture is Tosin, and Tosin is teaching them, was at the beginning, where we had to actually teach them how to type, we had to teach them what the computer is before you even begin to say, oh, what, go, let's go to the command line. We had to go from like the very basics and teach them um, this, which we had support also from um, a youth fellowship initiative and the founders of TechMe. One of the girls called Jane had this to say. So we, the Smart Girls Project made cover page of like a major newspaper um, in Nigeria, and she had this to say. She said, I hated computers because I kept failing the subject in school. I mean, who would blame her, right? I couldn't even put it on and off. 
I was scared each time I saw a computer, always thinking if I touched it, it would spoil, meaning if I touched it, it would just break, right? So it, it, it felt like this abstract thing. Now, all my fears are gone. I can now code. I'm also very bold now in the class when it comes to answering questions about computer. This, this actually is resounding because even giving the confidence in these girls, these little girls, and seeing that they can do it, and it's not so much of a big deal, um, you know, has gone on to actually change their perspective from a concept that they're very scared of to a concept that, you know what, I think I want to keep learning and I want to be a developer. So yes, this is, this is, <laughs> this is how it went. Um, so we, we've talked a little bit about what's ha been happening, and um, now we want to talk a little bit, have a bit of a discussion about um, some questions that will help clarify the implications of all this. And uh, I, I think the most challenging um, two words up there are in Africa. So we've talked about this quite a lot, actually. What is one of the biggest problems about talking about Africa? Africa is not a big country. It's a huge continent, and it's not just huge. We have very <laughs> different... No, go on and clap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's made up of very different people and very different communities, and you'll find out that even in a country, for example, like Nigeria, there, we are in ourselves very different and probably have more in common with an Italian than we would have with a Ghanaian or Namibian. So we are very different. So there is no summing up Africa in one con con content. Africa is huge and it's different experiences for different cultures and for different places. Absolutely. So just to give you an idea, it, you know, it's something like one-fifth of the world's land mass. So you could cram most of the other continents on top of uh, Africa home to 1.2 billion people, uh, some 50-plus countries, and depending on how you count them, between um, up, up to 3,000 different languages. So this is vast ethnic and cultural diversity. So, you know, if, if you an Italian and you're going to Belgium or somewhere saying, wow, it's so different here, you've seen nothing. Um, and Africa is not just different. Africa's... We're very different uh, from, from Africa. Africa. Africa is different from, from Africa, yeah. Yes. The, yeah. the difference is great as much as between a, um, a Nigerian and a Namibian as opposed to maybe a Nigerian and a British. It's actually very hard to travel within Africa. I'm a Nigerian and I need to get a visa to go to South Africa, to Kenya, to anywhere else, which is which is um, a luxury that I see that the European Union have, because you, once you're from Europe, you can go and you have freedom of movement, but we don't have that. And actually, Pycon Namibia, or Namibia was actually the first African country outside of Nigeria that had ever been. So it's, we don't even know ourselves for the most part, because the, it's, the ease of movement is not, as, it's not as easy as it seems, like, oh, it's just Africa. But no, we have had to get a visa, like everyone else that's coming from anywhere else. It's, sometimes it's even easy, for, if you're from Europe, to come to a country like South Africa than it is for like, a Nigerian to go to a country like yeah, South Africa. Absolutely, or, or Namibia, where most Europeans don't need visas. Yes. But uh, Nigerians <laughs> have to jump through hoops. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, here's a question that we've encountered and also spoken about. Um, you know, what does Africa really need? Does Africa need access to software and high technology? Or does it need things like universal basic education, vaccinations, clean drinking water, and basic healthcare? In other words, aren't PyCons or are PyCons a kind of frivolous luxury in the African context? Africa needs technology too. So we use technology, and this is where I see a role in open source software, such like Python. We use it to solve our own problems. Now we have people developing apps that can help with waste management, that can help people access better healthcare. Africa, it's not a luxury to have PyCon. It's, it, it's, it's a necessity that we need, and that's our reality. We need technology too, we need software, we have businesses, we have telcos, and no, it's not a luxury. Yeah. So it's, uh, um, Africa is going to need software, 
it's not an alternative reality where they don't use software. And since it's going to need software, it faces the same choice that everybody faces between being a producer or a consumer of the things that you need. And the choices for African economies are pretty simple. Either it can buy the software it must have, or it can find a way to build it, maintain it, adapt it, and own it itself. And if it can't do that, it will have to buy it. And that will mean valuable money leaving African um, economies. Um, and this is where open source software comes in, because open source software, I mean, don't think that open source software is something magical, but it's an opportunity. It represents a possibility to make that um, uh, possible, to make it an economic uh, viability. And PyCons, as we saw from the Namibian case, are really um, important as a way of helping open source software get uh, traction and users in Africa. There's another thing I want about, about, um, about technology. So if you think that technology is MacBooks and um, iPhones. Uh, iPhones and you know, um, wearable technology and things like that, then maybe Africa doesn't need those things. But if you stop thinking of technology as stuff that you buy and instead think of it as skills, then the question looks different. And saying, does Africa need technology, becomes the question, does Africa need skills? Does Africa need practical knowledge? And then it has a very different complexion, and it's much harder to think that skills are a luxury. Are a luxury. Yes. Um, we like denying that Africa doesn't deserve to have um, knowledge. Um, I, I don't know if you know these gentlemen. Um, they invented my MacBook. There's Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. Um, now, um, paradoxically, and I will tell you more about this in a moment, uh, free things can be unaffordable because they're free. In the African context, the hobbyism that strongly characterizes the open, software, open source software movement really is a luxury because we're used in the West to building projects, skills, contacts, um, even industries as hobbyists, as amateurs, spare time enthusiasts. But all that is only possible when there already exists a well-established industry and networks, when there's an established faith in the industry, when there's plenty of spare money and spare time and easy access to resources and information. So hobbyism is kind of parasitic on established business success. And You've got more to say about this subject, I think. I'm sorry, did you say hobbies? Yes, hobbies. We don't have time for that. <laughs> the thing is, we need to make sure that whatever we're doing can at least generate revenue, because money is not a dirty word if you don't have lots of it. If you have to... If you're living in a place or in a country where there's no 24 hours to, there's no 24 hour access to electricity and you have to buy generator and buy fuel to run and you have to ration, okay, how much charge do I have on my laptop versus when do I turn on the generator and get charged and how much longer can I um, work with and you have to deal with noise pollution, air pollution, noise, everything. And we don't have time for hobbies. We need to make sure that whatever we're doing is profitable, is productive, right? I think that's I think you should say, though, where we're talking about that you can't rely on 24-hour electricity. Are you talking about the remote backwards of...? No, no. so this is Nigeria, which is a different reality and for Namibia. In which cities? Almost every in, city. In big cities. So even in big cities, you can't rely on... Yeah. yeah. So you can't rely on, on that. And um, we don't have time for that. So, so there is... The aspect of we need to make sure that whatever we're doing can generate money. So we need to make sure that what, that we can um, afford the time. Time is a luxury for most people because you have to make sure the power is banked. Some people don't even have computers at home, so they need to borrow. So you, there is like so much we're working against, or so much working against us that even sometimes the basic necessities are like a luxury where you don't even have internet for the most part. So it's work. It's not fun, and that's why Python's for us is serious business. Yeah. 
So I don't know how many people here have also been community event organizers. Has anyone else organized a, a PyCon here or an event or even a meetup or something? <laughs> yeah, I see a few hands. Well, you'll know that you, you'll have faced all kinds of challenges and spanners in the work. And you don't have to go to Africa to find them. So this is um, from my DjangoCon Europe in 2015 when uh, a boy band disrupted our conference by uh, suddenly selling every hotel bed in the city after our conference had already started selling tickets. Or in um, uh, the PyCon okay. UK a couple of years ago. Um, so anything can, can um, come up unexpectedly. But still, um, let's look at it this way. Um, Python in Europe is, you know, it's funny, there's uh, Monty Python, and Python software is characterized by this light-hearted tone that Guido van Rossum very wisely established right at the beginning. And we enjoy it in all kinds of ways, so it's fun. You, know, you have funny snakes and so on. Um, what do you have to say about uh, funny snakes, uh, Aisha? Snakes in Africa is not funny. <laughs> I'm really serious. <laughs> Take, for example, in Nigeria, for a period of six months, we were trying to register as a not-for-profit with the government, and it took us a lot of going back and forth, and we had to change our names so many times, because the government, or the officials were like, Python? Are you a cult? We don't approve such. And no, this is actually after giving them a five-page document explaining open source and what Python does and how Python is a software. We eventually convinced them after six months of going back and forth and you know, changing our names and finally say, OK, Python, and they told us, they, they gave us a name and said, why don't you say Python software community so that it's very explicit and no one thinks that, you know, because, because for us, Python represents negative. It's a threat. We see it as a threat. It's, it's harmful. I mean, people die from that thing, you know. So it's, it's not funny for us. Another example in Zimbabwe was when um, a girl, a, a, a parent actually pulled out a child from a Jungle Girls event because she saw me with my Europython shirt and a huge snake was it. And she's like, there's no way I'm going to let my daughter be a part of that. There is no way. And, you know, it took um, Hannah actually having to go to the woman and explain and tell her, um, explain to her what Python is as a software, but not Python as a snake or as a demonic um, idea that many people are used to. Same thing happened in Oshogbo in, um, in the western part of Nigeria where um, the girl, the, a company actually, at the last minute pulled out from hosting the Django Girls event because they said, Django? No way, that's like Django Unchained. If anyone has ever seen Django Unchained, we, it's against our religious belief and we will not support that. And, and the day before the event, they had to run around looking for, for another venue. And it just, sometimes it's preposterous, it doesn't make any sense. But this is our reality. Um, we just have to be careful with our, our snakes because they might not be as attractive as they are to us as they are to other people. Do you think if Gaido had an African friend, he would still have called it Python? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if, that's a good point. So if, if, um, you know, if, if Guido had been developing Python in the beginning with an African friend, perhaps the name Python would have made them stop and think for a, a minute. So this is, you know, you can't have too many useful perspectives when you're creating something. But this isn't really about snakes. It's about meaning, because in a global community like ours, symbols and images and names are going to have unexpected meanings. And we can't rely on a narrow cultural perspective to find things that will work well. Um, Aisha, can you explain to our audience what African time is? I think this might be important for anybody who's <laughs> planning to go to a, an African PyCon. Right. So I will cut the long story short. But an advice to everyone here, if you're ever going to organize an event where you expect Africans to attend, and the actual time is 7 p.m., in the invite you send out, tell them it's actually 4 p.m. Give them three hours buffer, because if you say 7 p.m., no one is going to arrive at your event until 9, and you don't want that, right? <laughs> yeah, we, organizing the events in Namibia, we uh, 
Namibians are extremely relaxed. They're much too cool to, to hurry. So everything does happen, but it happens in Namibian time. Meanwhile, the European co-organizers are sitting at home going, yeah, because uh, nothing seems to be happening. But in fact, it all just happens at the last moment. The other important thing, <laughs> the other important thing is that um, the personal touch, I think, is this is a consistent thing in Africa, isn't it? That yes. Did you experience this when you yes, were in Yes. Oh, well, in, you can bombard people with email messages for months and nothing will happen. And then you walk into their office and talk to them for 45 minutes, and the first 30 minutes of the conversation will be about their children, and in the final 15 minutes, absolutely everything will be organized in a way that you could never do in Europe. So there are different ways of uh, uh, doing things. And, it's less stressful if you know that it's going to happen like that. Yeah, heads up, guys. Heads up. <laughs> there's another thing. Uh, expectations work in other ways, too. So there's a long history of African technological brilliance and mastery that when discovered by the West is not even recognized because of disbelief that it could have come from Africa. So I don't know if you've heard of the Benin bronzes. They came from actually from Nigeria, not from Benin, from the ancient Benin kingdom. Oh, I come from that state. You come from Edo yeah, State. Edo state yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the Benin bronzes were these thousands of works created in the 14th and 19th centuries. They're not actually bronzes, most of them are, are, are brass or other materials. Most of them are now in Western museums and collections because they were all looted by the British in 1897. But when they arrived in Europe, experts, art experts, were astounded. And they couldn't believe that this stuff had been made by people so, quotes, primitive and savage. Not just because of the art, but because of the understanding of metallurgy that went into producing things like this. So they kept coming up with different theories about how uh, the Africans managed to make these things. They must have learned it from the Portuguese traders, for example. And they just couldn't believe that this was African technology. So that's just one example, but I think there's a real danger that if some new technological advance comes out of Africa, it simply might not be recognized because it won't fit Western or European expectations. Um, but it's not just Europeans who might have to reassess their ideas of African technology, is it? No. We, we will Africans buy African technology? So we sometimes have the mindset that, which I would say resulted from back in the day, maybe in colonialism, where we feel that things foreign or things abroad are better than what we do or what we build in, um, within Africa. So we've actually started a lot of movements around buy Nigeria to grow Nigeria, buy Nara to grow Nara, buy Namibia to grow Namibia, buy Africa to grow Africa. And this has also translated into technology, where we're trying to encourage um, companies within Nigeria to buy our own locally made software as opposed to believing in, you know, the softwares that come from the, you know, the foreign, anywhere else, Asia, um, Europe, or even America. And this is just an example of how Nigerians love Italian shoes, right? There's this, there's this class that goes with, oh, my shoes are Italian. You don't want to say, I have a made in Abba shoes, right? Because Abba is a, is a city, is an industrialized city in Nigeria. And so we have actually, actually started this movement of um, buy made in Abba because we're as good, as much quality as you would get anywhere else in the world. We've been talking about Python in Africa, but what about Africans in um, uh, Python? So if there's going to be a new generation of African Python programmers or Python community members, what new ideas or applications or insights are we going to see coming out from them? What, what could we imagine? We just don't know, right? We don't know yet, but we better be prepared for it when it comes, right? Because we already, as a community, understand the importance of diversity. No, diversity not just in gender, diversity in different domain knowledge. So now, imagine bringing the community of African Pythonistas integrated with the rest of the world. Just imagine what that could mean, but I have no know. idea. We don't, we don't know, we don't know yet. yet. Yeah. So, um, but 
don't be like um, 19th century art critics and simply miss it when it's staring you in the face. Um, so what's next for um, uh, Python in Africa? Well, I honestly think Python is special, and there's a good reason why we that, uh, that first conference was a Python conference and not just an open source software conference. It was because of the community of friends, of companies that we knew we could rely on to make it uh, happen. And we've seen how the community internationally has helped start not just a PyCon in, uh, a PyCon in Namibia, but also a Python community for uh, Namibia. So Python's the way in. It's not actually about Python. You know, it's not for us to say what software Africans should be learning. They're going to need, Africa is going to need to make its own choices, but Python gives us a great way into introducing these technologies and skills into Africa. Python, because of, because of its community, probably also because of the strength of the language itself, can lead the way. So the future looks pretty good. But the last part of our talk, just a couple of minutes left, is we want to address you as our audience who've been so kind to listen to us now. And we want to frame a question in your mind. It does Python in Africa need your help, or does it need your participation and engagement in Africa? Africa does not need to be saved or taught, right? We can do a lot of these things ourselves, but we want to be a part of your community. We want to be a part of our community, not just about charity. We want you to come. We want you to teach, maybe, and we also want you to learn from us because there's so much knowledge that you can gain just by talking to someone completely different with a completely different experience than you're already used to or to the people around you. So, yes, yeah. we want your participation. We want you to join us. We want to join us. Come to an African yeah. PyCon. Um, it's really an invitation. Um, there they are. You know where to come over the next... Uh, 12 months. We want you to make new friends um, in Africa. And keep them. Yeah, because when you have an experience like that, it's something that will stay with you for your entire life and will be something really meaningful. Um, we don't want you to be a tourist. Be a Pythonista okay. in Africa. Um, if, if you come and have the experience of finding out from an African schoolboy what his plans are, for the future in computing for his country. That's an experience you'll never have as a tourist. So what we're offering you is a chance to um, literally to change the world. And to take back in the future. Um, because the future's right here. There it is. And you'll be amazed what a difference you can make to it. And um, there's the future. And there's the future. And you'll find that you too are transformed by the in yeah. so, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asha. Hello? Yeah. Thank you very much for this very inspiring keynote. As a Python, Python, uh, you're a Python organizer, I have an immediate question. How can we learn to figure out to set up a conference like this in five minutes? It was Sorry, I didn't hear the clue. Oh, actually, you said um, everything can happen there on short notice, like in the last five oh, minutes. Yes. Um, and I, I was just like asking, like, probably a rhetorical question. Can we do a workshop for this for Euro Python? <laughs> I mean, I can actually give... Um, sorry, I think my microphone is making a lot of noise. Um, we can give an example of that in the... Uh, the second PyCon Namibia, we got... Uh, I'm not sure who's making that noise. In the second PyCon Namibia, we got a call early in the morning to say that the conference wasn't going to start that day because there were student protests at the university and the venue was shut down. Now, fortunately, we had a day in hand because we'd planned a social day at the end of the conference. So we went straight to a hotel and uh, we said, we've got a problem. We've got 120 people coming for a Python conference. We need audiovisual supplies, uh, services in, in three different or two different halls, 
and we need catering for 120 people, and we need it tomorrow. And they said, yeah, we can do that. And <laughs> if you tried that anywhere in Europe, I'd be saying, wow, it's impossible. So things do happen uh, and can happen in, in, different, um, in different ways. Yeah. Uh, we're happy to take some questions from the audience, yeah, aren't sure. we? Yes, sure. Sure. Keep them questions. short Roger as possible hand. so as many people can have questions um, as possible. Hello, thanks for the amazing talk. It was super inspiring. During uh, the last few days of the conference, I met people from all, all over the world. And what would be your advice for them if they want to start a local Python community in, in their own city or country? Um, hi. Okay. Well, I would say the best way is to probably reach out to... It's always easier when you have someone on ground that can help out. So the best way would be to maybe reach out to a community like ours or any other community in Africa and be like, okay, we want to start um, another community and let this collaboration exist. As opposed to um, trying to organize it outside without having anyone on the internet to help push them because you still need... With, even with a community, you still need to be able to have that personal touch, that one-on-one -on -one, um, contact with someone. and. Honestly, emails are great, but there's nothing still beats personal communication and interaction. So, yeah. Uh, or you can just get lucky and find that your colleague is planning this multi year project. You know, so it's just, things to happen just by chance. You have to talk to as many people as possible, and you will eventually talk to the right person, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You'll turn off our headphones. Okay, we'll use this microphone instead, shall we? Yes, okay, we'll do that. Uh, if we're on the same frequency, yeah. I've just okay. been advised. I'm very sorry yeah. for this. Um, so, uh, questions, here's the next question. And uh, if you have any more questions, please come down here. Um, if you sit there, please take this route, and everybody from here just come down for questions, because I was at the social until 3 o'clock. Okay, so I was, I actually uh, met a person from South Africa last, uh, at last year's year of Python, and he invited me to PyCon Namibia, but I kind of chickened out because, like, Johannesburg isn't the safest place in the world, to be exact. But, like, uh, if I come to Python Namibia, for example, like, can you tell me that it's going to be okay and I don't have to worry about anything, for example? Okay, so this is, you know, Africa is unknown to many people. Um, you met Ivan, our friend from South Africa. That, yes, yeah. so we're, he's coming to Nigeria, he's of course. Yeah, Nigeria. yeah. Uh, so he's he's a wonderful person. Namibia is a democracy with a functioning free press, a robust free press. Uh, has elections and governments that get voted out by the people, and people who lose their jobs in the correct way. It's a really, really safe place to be. It's much safer than uh, most of. South Africa in, in terms of personal safety. Um, and e even places that are less stable than Namibia, they're not wild places. Exactly. It's not like you'll be walking on the road and someone's just going to grab you for the most part. And we're aware of this problem. And most communities, like for Pika Nigeria, we're actually putting some extra um, security measures to make sure, I mean, I mean, it's in Lagos. We don't usually have as much um, occurrences like in the northern part where there's Boko Haram and there's terrorism. So yeah, it's not, it's, yeah. It's not always yeah. Kumbaya, but... Yeah. <laughs> our, our friend Luke, who's been to every uh, Pike on Namibia, came this year with his seven-year-old, or his six-year-old son. So, you know, it's, it's perfectly safe. We should mention, though, that um, most African societies are quite conservative, socially conservative, aren't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, unfortunately, um, for gay or transgender people, mm -hmm. Africa might not always be, the best sadly, place. the most welcoming place. And it's not for Europeans to start lecturing Africans on what standards they should have. But I hope that the, this encounter that we've been talking about might change some of those attitudes just because people are meeting each other and being friends. Um, so, I mean, there are things to be aware of um, in many places in Africa. 
uh, homosexual activity is, is not legal, sadly. Yeah. So, one more question from the audience. I might want to skip in one of my questions as well. So, are PyCons in Africa, then do they have like a similar code of conduct as we do in Europe, or is it maybe an issue to set something like up like this? So, yes, we do have a code of conduct, and we have just like a Europe Python having like dedicated people um, specific for that. You know, don't do anything, just code of conduct, because this is very important and very crucial, because everyone needs to feel welcome. Yes, we do have in our conferences. Yeah. And, and taken, ex taken extremely seriously yeah. as well, yes. Um, and we're not, sh we're not shy of putting in the code of conduct that, for example, homophobic behavior or language is not tolerated. Yes. So we can still share the values of our community where we go, you just have to do it in the, an appropriate way. Yeah. Hi, thank you, it's quite inspiring. Uh, you've shown that it's growing really fast. My question to you is, what does it mean in numbers? When can we say that, let's say, 1% of new graduates know Python? I'm not sure I get it. When, when you, when you say that 1% of new university graduates uh, had some experience with Python. Okay, so for example, in Nigeria, Python is not being taught or as a standard in universities. What we have now, uh, lecturers, uh, actually part of the Python Nigeria community signal, had early championing teaching Python in universities. So for example, people still learn COBOL, Perl, BASIC, Pascal, yeah, those kind of languages that make you cringe. And you know, some more uh, modern universities do C, C++, and Java, but we're hoping that with communities like this, we can you know, make it a standard, because honestly, Python is one of the very friendly, beginner-friendly languages to learn. Yeah, we, we, people have said this multiple times. People have said that multiple times to us in, in Namibia, for example. Hi, thank you. Speaking with friends that works in cooperation uh, in the African countries. Uh, they told me that uh, after they set up an uh, institution for teaching uh, medicine, uh, uh, engineering, and so on, uh, one of the problems they have is that uh, they come from many European and American countries to teach, and when the students have learned, they just leave as possible uh, their country. So uh, in time where they go, they, after each two or three years, they meet always different people because, uh, well, that's it. Yeah. I think one of the things that we've discovered, I, Aisha mentioned, she talked about the kind of seriousness in which this is all taken, like the Django Girls events in, in, uh, uh, in Nigeria, where they're tackling really serious things. And I showed you some of the pictures from the school children giving lightning talks in, in Namibia towards the end. Um, and every time one of these young people stands up in front of a microphone, they're talking about how can we, what they want to know is, well, how can we bring what we've just learned to other people, maybe in rural areas of their country? So they are thinking about their own country and about people in their society who actually don't have the same opportunities as them. And we've seen them, for example, the, the um, university students going into the schools straight away to share this stuff with the kids. So I think the, com the, the actual Python community keeps people together. If people have got skills, they'll find those skills are at work in their community, keeping people in the country, generating work in the country and revenue and money and so on in the country and that's that's the hope yeah i mean a personal example is i learned about python when i had the opportunity or the privilege to be here in 2015 at europe python and I, then i went back home and organized just one event and that had like a ripple event i mean effect where now we have like 31 so it's like I've learned so much about the community, which is so amazing, so great. I want this back home, and I took it back home. So I would say it differs for many people. People have the, what motivates them. Because when I learned about Django, I was like, I need to go and show women in Nigeria that we're not all about fashion and catering, that we can code and we can be good and great engineers too. So it, it differs. Because people are literally... <laughs> 
Um, th there's nothing wrong with video games and, and, and the fun part of uh, programming and computing that, that many people enjoy. But you'll see that when people get hold of this technology in Africa, they want to turn it so, so the, like Ronald's, uh, so that a Zimbabwe way and factory man manufacturing soap can work more efficiently, so that um, uh, uh, market traders can find a better, uh, make sure that they sell all their, their food. They're concerned with real local problems, and that's what's on their minds. And so I think that is what keeps people there. Okay, we're already running way over time, so one last Short question, short answer, short but answer. I guess you will be you're around today all day and I think you're really happy yes. to ask any questions which come to our mind, I guess. Rwanda is ready for a PyCon. I don't know how to do that, but it really needs to be done. Yeah, he said Rwanda is ready for PyCon and it has to be done and he wants to you know, be the champion of that. Sorry? Rwanda. Oh, Rwanda. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. There is. Uh, there is. All, there are Django companies in in Kigali, for example. Oh. Yeah. So, um, from thank you so much for listening to us. It's meant an awful lot to us to be here. It's a huge honour and um, means a great deal to, deal to us. There's uh, some information there that you should follow up or you can follow up with Aisha and me. We'd love to talk to you. I have some PyCon Namibia stickers if your laptop has got a blank space on it. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, and thank you. we'll see you at a PyCon in Africa. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>